Natural language processing researchers who have been around for long enough have navigated a number of changes in their research areas. Today we're faced with interesting questions like how far attention will get us in language tasks and how much language alone can teach AI systems. My guest today, Sasha Rush, has been studying text generation, efficient algorithms and hardware for language tasks, building open source projects, and doing much besides that for years. Our conversation delves into some of his prior work, how he thinks about the past and present of NLP, and what he's paying attention to now. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I'm your host, Daniel Bashir. If you're listening to this and you're not subscribed to the Gradient in some way, I think you should go fix that. You can subscribe to the podcast on your usual podcast player to make sure you get episodes when I release them every week. And if you want to get the rest of what we put out on The Gradient, that means this podcast, our newsletter, and articles from our online magazine, then you can subscribe to us through Substack. And finally, if you like what we're doing, it would really mean a lot to all of us if you consider sharing this or whatever else you like on The Gradient. We're a pretty small team. This podcast is a one-man effort, and the entire Gradient publication is run by a very small group of dedicated volunteers. So whenever you do share our things around, when you leave comments for us, when you give us feedback, we all really, really appreciate it. But now, without further ado, Sasha Rush. Professor Rush, you've been doing a really wide variety, I think, of very interesting work. And of course, your own work in NLP has kind of evolved over time. But I'd love to start at the beginning for you. How did you get interested in AI and NLP in the first place? Yeah, it's a really good question. I've always been interested in language. That was what drew me to the field to begin with. Uh, My dissertation work is on syntax and translation. And in particular, I'm interested in kind of how you would translate between two different languages that have very different syntactic structure. Um, During my PhD, I was interested in this topic from the point of view of optimization. So I was very interested in how we could rephrase problems of, say, translating from English to Japanese in terms of a mathematical program. So a lot of the work I did at that point was thinking about things like integer linear programming how you kind of come up with new algorithms, how you make this all efficient in practice. And in retrospect, that that does seem like a kind of far cry from where NLP has ended up. Uh, But at the time, this was kind of an important problem in the field. Uh, I actually did an internship at Google to implement some of this stuff in their production systems. And it was kind of really important that we take a sentence, come up with this syntactic structure, and use that for all sorts of downstream tasks. So that's kind of where the field was at the time. Uh, I was kind of fascinated by that sort of area. Um, But yeah, it certainly moved uh, in a very different direction. Yeah, maybe in reflecting on the different direction the field kind of ended up going in, it's in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense that the transformer architecture and the things that we're using today scaled really well. Can you reflect at all on why the optimization approaches you were taking at the time didn't necessarily work out, maybe didn't scale in the same ways, things like that. Yeah, so the history of NLP had been, even at that point, a kind of bounce back and forth between the importance of learning and the importance of inference. The particular area of machine translation was always one where data was critically important. And there's very famous work that looked at kind of learning basically from scratch how to do translation. So certainly always been on the learning side of things. I think maybe where I went wrong is I thought that inference was really a critical part of the process. And that complex inference that kind of utilized learned models to make predictions was critically important. So one way you can think about this is like um, when AlphaGo came out, Uh, A lot of that was an advance in learning, but it still had a lot of inference, like Monte Carlo tree search. I was kind of interested in the kind of Monte Carlo tree search part of NLP at the time, and I thought that would play a larger role going forward. I think maybe what I didn't predict was just how much data there was in NLP and how just learning more and more on that data would make things better. 
So a few people that I've spoken to who were maybe initially or a while ago pursuing slightly different uh, research interests, so Jonathan Frankel, for instance, who spent a lot of time on lottery tickets, really, when I spoke to him, seemed to have switched his views on what an important research problem is. And multiple times over the course of our interview, he told me that he doesn't think lottery tickets are something people should be working on anymore. And I'm curious if the current paradigm we're in right now has maybe caused you to reflect similarly, or whether you think maybe current training paradigms, architectures are missing something to endow NLP systems with the kinds of things you want them to have. Yeah, so uh, Jonathan Frankel and I are are, are interesting cases um, in in several ways. Um, one thing that's interesting is that um, uh, I had left Harvard uh, about four or five years ago, and they recently hired him. Uh, so I think we've had similar career paths in that way. Um, I would also say that I don't think of myself as uh, particularly conservative. I think I understand the importance of engineering and building large models. It's something I'm passionate about. But I think he's really on the extreme in the sense of him thinking that almost everything uh, that we should be doing is really on the engineering side of the equation. I still think that uh, it's very possible that there will be a significant shift in kind of core questions about deep learning and that we should uh, have an environment where people feel comfortable to work on things that aren't just making models larger or making them more efficient. Uh, probably um, most uh, emblematic of this is the fact that he and I have a long bet uh, where uh, a couple of years ago we, we made a bet about whether transformers would continue to be the dominant architecture in NLP after five years. So we're about, uh, we're about two years into that bet, and I think he'll likely win it. Uh, I think they'll likely stick around for the next three years. Um, but I think it represents kind of my uh, optimism about the possibility of architectures. Okay, as a follow-up to this, then, to what you said, it is pretty clear, I think, to everyone that there's a lot of important work to be done on the engineering side of things, on scaling up models. And it, I think in any case, can be kind of hard to justify very extreme positions on one or the other side of these debates. And right now, at least sort of being within the ML community, it does seem like there is quite a bit of sentiment that... I don't know if it goes all the way to where Jonathan is, but it definitely reflects that AI is all about engineering kind of mindset, I think. And you see more and more people who are really good engineers going into AI, which is fantastic. And I think that at the same time, that's kind of manifesting in the way people think about the field, at least a lot of people that I see talking about it. And so as I'm coming up with this question, I realize this might be one of the silliest hypotheticals I could ask you and is also kind of similar to my last question, but we're going to go with it. Say that you're like the puppet master and you kind of have all of the control over where funding, resources, people, you know, talent, where all that gets allocated in NLP research. How would you, how would you distribute it, whether that's for what you think is best for the field or just what you would like to see in the field? Huh. So... Um, I don't totally feel comfortable with answering the first question. Um, I'm a kind of strong believer in bottom-up control as opposed to top-down control of research. So I do think what's critically important is building environments and spaces where people feel comfortable trying new things to uh, kind of encourage new ideas. I, I think part of the reason I, I feel this way is from uh, my early work in NLP and feeling like I didn't predict well enough where things would go. And I felt like a lot of the work that was being done in deep learning kind of didn't feel like it had a home, either in a machine learning or an NLP context. And I think we should have been kind of more willing to kind of accept it, work with it, kind of understand its constraints at that time. Um, so that's kind of a, a general philosophy. Um, but in terms of how we get there, um, well, I'm putting um, my, my time where my, my mouth is on this front. Uh, recently, I've been working with a bunch of researchers to establish a new conference, which we're calling the Conference on Language Modeling, or COLUM. Uh, you can go to the website. Uh, it'll be launched next year in October, and the deadline for papers is in March uh, 2024. The goal of that conference is really to think about this question of, what are the kind of main topics that we think are very interesting for the future of language modeling? Uh, 
and to establish an academic community where people are free to work on them and build new systems. Uh, we put out a call for papers, and if you go through the topics, you can see that they're pretty different than what's traditionally studied in natural language processing, and also pretty different than what's studied in iClear. So we think this is a new space for working on these topics and where they move going forward. Um, and one thing that's been particularly interesting about this process is that the program chairs are a combination of academics and people in industry. And actually, I think the people in industry are the most kind of uh, interested in having people think about topics that aren't just scaling. I think they're kind of aware that they kind of have that part under control and they're looking for new ideas that maybe they don't have time to think about or uh, think that will actually kind of have the potential to change where, where that field is moving. Interesting. While we're still kind of on some of these high level questions, one thing that you brought out a couple of times here is the importance of establishing a community where people pursuing different directions of research that may or may not necessarily be the dominant paradigm feel like they have a home, feel comfortable. In your experience, what do you think has contributed to research environments feeling more or less comfortable in that way? And how would you kind of craft an environment like that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so speaking from the context that I aware, I'm like aware that um, my experience may not be the same as everyone else, I think the kind of key first idea is, is getting a, a group of people together um, listening to different ideas, bringing people in from different backgrounds or different perspectives uh, to try to help in that process itself. Um, from, from there, I think um, my, my goal has been to kind of acknowledge that um, in, in research, you're trying to kind of build a portfolio of different ideas. We don't know that one idea is going to work out 100% of the time. And so it's okay for people to take these kind of 5% bets and uh, kind of uh, see where they, they head. Um, that all being said, I, I do think it's important that researchers get feedback, uh, get, get, real, um, get real about their results, have kind of empirical measures and goals that they're working to as a community. Uh, and I think that it is important that people kind of agree on, on what those are, uh, at least so there's some sort of ground truth that, that, that the community can be working towards. Makes sense. And I guess thinking about the work that you're doing right now, and maybe we can begin using this as a bit of a segue to talk about that more in detail. The portfolio approach to research is definitely something that I've heard a couple of times before and the 5% bets idea as well. Right now, in among the research you're doing, and you've mentioned how some of your previous ideas also didn't work out because of maybe misidentifying what seemed important or would be important, but at the moment, among the different things you're focused on, is there anything that you'd identify in particular as something like a 5% bet? Oh, interesting question. Uh, let me think about that a little bit more. Um, so I think probably the, the main thing that's, that's most connected to the previous conversation is that um, I've been kind of interested in exactly this question of what architectures besides transformers uh, might work out. Um, I've been particularly fascinated by a class of architectures called state space models. Um, they both have a kind of mathematical maturity and understanding of how they work, as well as promising initial results and very nice efficiency properties. Um, and that combination of ideas um, has made them a topic of, of interest for me. Uh, I've been following the work of Albert Gu, um, who's now a professor at CMU, uh, on this topic. Um, and um, I recently put together a tutorial that went over how they work and, and, and how they are used. The short story is that they're uh, basically a type of model that's mathematically equivalent to a linear recurrent neural network. Uh, so that's like an RNN that you may have been used to from the 2015 period. Um, but you remove the nonlinearity. So there's no uh, TANH or ReLU as part of the recurrence. And because you do that, you're able to run them much more efficiently in practice. And they run basically in a similar way as running a convolutional neural network. Uh, because you're able to do that, they run very efficiently on modern hardware, particularly during training, but also during inference. Um, and that's a, a very nice property that gets rid of a lot of the issues that running transformers uh, at large scales uh, uh, encounter. Um, 
because of all this, I've been really interested in building this. We recently built a version that uh, replicates the performance of BERT on many tasks. Uh, and we've been working on another version for diffusion models. Uh, other folks have been working on trying to scale these up to the size of large language models. So I don't know if this is uh, going to work out. It might be that transformers are too ingrained in the culture right now, uh, but I'd really like to see these other architectures thrive. Um, one other kind of point on, on this front is that uh, another researcher I've encountered in the process of working on this is uh, Tree Dow, who's going to be a professor at Princeton next year. And I think he embodies something that I really think is important for a modern graduate student in that he's both really, really good at the low level technical details, but also kind of a curious thinker and willing to try out all sorts of uh, different ideas. Uh, and so I think if you can kind of get both of those skills together in a, in a modern sense, you can really uh, build some really cool things. I like that a lot. Yeah. So you mentioned when it comes to state space models, and I'm aware of the pre-training without attention work that you had this year with Albert Gu and a couple of other folks, that you were exploring this bi-directional pre-training task with state space models. And you mentioned a couple of the things that state space models could provide that transformers don't necessarily. And I'm curious if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on that difference you see when it comes to, if you were thinking about of course, we don't know everything about what's going to work out in the future. But if you were thinking just about going forward, what transformers offer us, what state space models offer us, how you currently think about and evaluate that trade-off. Sure. Um, so in the perfect world, you get a model that's a state space model that has exactly the same number of parameters as, say, Llama 7 billion. Let's say it works actually at the same performance level. I mean, that's a big if, but I think it's possible. Now that you have this model, you're in a really good position. So one thing that's really nice about it is it entirely doesn't require any storage of keys and values. So if you've ever tried to implement Llama, you'll know that one of the most annoying parts is the key value cache and actually keeping that around and making it efficient in practice. In a in this kind of theoretical model, that entirely goes away. You also have near infinite history. So this is assuming that you're able to learn enough from the history to make it useful. But you can start to imagine having extremely large uh, context lengths and keeping track of just a tremendous amount of few shot examples. Now, again, with the caveat that this would have to work as well, it starts being a really nice and convenient model, both from its theoretical sense but also from the fact that it would be really useful in practice. So in the near infinite history and large context lens part, it's I know it's been explored that transformers have things like this lost in the middle problem when you present them with very long context. So state space models, it sounds like, does that mitigate the problem somewhat when you're using those? Yeah, I think it's an open question and we'll have to see what happens when people scale these approaches. The the big question is whether that property is emerging because of the way that we train these models, in which case this doesn't really help, or if it's some fundamental property of the architecture. Um, my guess is it's a property of the data and the task we train on and not anything to do with the actual architecture itself. Um, that being said, it'll be interesting to see what these trade-offs actually look like in practice. And in general, I would kind of really like to have another reference model so that we can actually kind of make deeper statements about uh, how these problems arise. I want to jump back in time a little bit at this point, actually, to a paper with Yoon Kim and Chris Dyer in 2019. And this one was more about probabilistic context-free grammars. We don't have to go too much into the details of what kind of happened in this paper, but I want to ask you maybe a version of a question I've asked a number of people, which was, there's right now, as you've said, sort of a set of models that people are putting a lot of focus into, and maybe we're exploring some new things like state space models. And it feels like we've moved past the era where we were thinking really deeply about things like RNNs or even about context-free grammars. And I think there, there's still people who are working on that kind of stuff, but not nearly as much. And I'm curious to your mind, do you feel like there's a lot of value in somebody doing NLP research today, focusing on understanding, thinking about things like PCFGs. 
Frankly, probably not. Um, I still think context-free grammars are a really elegant formalism. Um, and if you're thinking about them in the context of cognitive science or linguistics or trying to understand language in a deeper sense, then absolutely. But if you're kind of trying to actually use them in practice, I consider it basically a solved problem. Uh, for me personally, it was always a means to an end. I kind of believed that we needed to first solve PCFGs before we could move forward uh, on, on NLP. And so uh, that's the reason I initially studied it. That being said, I will defend this paper in that this paper is about how you induce context-free grammars from raw language. I think that's an interesting and fascinating problem that connects to uh, cognitive development and how languages work, even if it's not kind of central for making better NLP systems. That makes sense to me. Staying back in time a little bit, and I guess going back even further, I think I'm maybe just going to jump around papers here, if that's okay. Um, you have a really interesting one also with Yoon Kim 2016 on sequence level knowledge distillation. And I think that one kind of thing that I pulled out from here was the idea of approximating sequence level distributions from word level distributions. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about those differences and some of the unique challenges that come along in that type of thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's funny that you ask about this. I'm actually seeing Yoon in about an hour. He's coming by uh, New York. Um, so I'm excited to grab lunch with him. Um, yeah, so uh, this paper is sequence level knowledge distillation. Um, I think I'm going to look back at this as probably uh, one of the most important projects I've worked on. At the time, I didn't think about that at all. Uh, we were kind of playing around particularly with machine translation models. And we just wanted to try knowledge distillation, which seemed to work really well for images, on machine translation. The problem we ran into was just that it didn't work very well for language. We tried to distill the distribution of next word prediction, just like it was an ImageNet model. So we just tried to take a big model and learn a small model's next word prediction by copying it. Um, since that didn't work that well, we thought of other ways to do it. And the, the main idea we came up with was that we should be matching the distribution at the sequence level. So that is try to replicate the teacher's full translation, not just its individual words. Because of that, we came up with an approach where we basically generated from the teacher, regenerated all the training data, and then trained a small model on that data. And it worked extremely well. In fact, in this paper, we actually uh, ran some experiments on my Android phone. We were actually able to run translation on the phone, uh, which was really exciting at the time. The paper kind of went away until kind of recent years when people have just been very fascinated by this idea of knowledge distillation. We're seeing this applied to all sorts of different models. In fact, uh, just last week, we released a model that distilled uh, Whisper, the OpenAI speech recognition system, basically using a very similar approach. And it worked really well. We were able to speed up Whisper by about five times and actually run it in the web browser. Uh, we're also seeing all sorts of ways that people are using GPT-4 uh, for distillation, uh, methods like Alpaca that basically produce uh, sequences that you can train smaller models on using this approach. Um, so it turned out to be a kind of simple, basic idea, uh, but um, yeah, it works in a lot of different, different applications. Can you talk a little bit about your hypothesis for why this actually seemed to work better than, than approximating word level distributions. Yeah, so the hypothesis in the paper was that because when you generate a sequence, there's interdependencies between decisions, um, that you, what you really want to approximate is the large model's distribution over sequences. So think about this like extremely large space where instead of predicting words, you're predicting whole translations or, or whole responses. That's a very complex distribution, and it's hard to approximate with simple word distributions. To get around this problem in this paper, we argue that one approximation is to simply kind of take the argmax or to take multiple samples from the big model. That's obviously a very uh, raw approximation of the full space. 
Um, but if you can do that in a kind of clever way, either by kind of um, using filters to direct the process or, or trying to use uh, kind of additional knowledge, you can do a relatively good approximation uh, and then copy that with your smaller model. One thing you also called out at the end of the paper as a possible interesting future direction was combining pruning and knowledge distillation. And I'm curious if you're aware of, you know, more recent results along that line or kind of intuitions about that sort of thing being a good idea. Yeah. So um, one thing that's really neat about efficiency is that a lot of these different techniques seem to be somewhat orthogonal to each other. So you can do distillation and quantization and get kind of both wins, maybe not to 100%, but to some trade-off. Um, in work after this, uh, we did some pruning that also did knowledge distillation. Uh, I know this approach is also used in uh, kind of very successful models, um, such as, um, I'm trying to remember names, like Tiny Bird and Mobile Bird and things like that. Um, in terms of modern approaches, um, I think... For large language models, people have primarily been using quantization as a way of making things more efficient. Um, I would love to see more work on distilling large language models, possibly in conjunction with quantization. Um, I see a lot of work where people distill for specific tasks, um, but I'd love to see kind of like full-on distillation of a model kind of from scratch uh, from a, a bigger source. Maybe taking this up a level of abstraction, since this paper is about an approach for efficiency, and that's kind of one of your main interests in the type of NLP systems you want to build. We've mentioned knowledge distillation. We've mentioned pruning and quantization as an approach. Are there particular approaches to these right now that you found exciting or maybe directions uh, you just mentioned you'd like to see more in distilling and quantization, but is there anything else that you which people were working more on in efficiency. Oh, it's funny. I'm going to a workshop on this next week. So I wish you'd asked me after I saw all the cool new papers. Um, so what, one thing I, I, I should say is that from a research perspective, I, I sometimes get a little bored with efficiency work uh, because we know that there's a bunch of these tricks that work really well, kind of combinations of them uh, I kind of not not a big fan of papers of that form. Um, I think we should think about kind of new and creative ways uh, to make models more efficient. So um, one one thing I'm interested in in these days is how you can make fine tuning more efficient. In the sense of uh, backprop is just extraordinarily expensive for for memory reasons. So what are kind of wild ideas for how you train uh, without doing backprop? Um, so for instance, um, uh, there's a recent paper on zero, z zeroth order training of models that kind of only use the forward pass for, for training. Um, I don't know if I would, would use that, but it's a, it's a cool and, and pretty different idea. Um, and, and similarly, I mean, uh, ideas like LoRa or, or prompt tuning or all these things that, that kind of took a different tact to try to actually solve some of the efficiency problems people were dealing with in practice, I find quite interesting. Maybe let's switch to a different set of problems you worked on that are also a little bit more recent. You've had a couple of papers on prompting, and specifically one of them is this very big hugging face collaboration on multitask prompted training. You also did a very interesting more recent one on how many data points is a prompt worth. And I want to get into those in a second, but just very broadly, I'd love to know a little bit about how you think about, well, prompting and in-context learning and what these things are doing. I've spoken to a couple of people who have more of a Bayesian view on this. For example, Sewan Min has some really interesting work studying what seems to make in-context learning work and how you could view that as the model has already picked up kind of a, a template for solving this sort of problem and you're just reminding it or something of that sort, having it retrieve knowledge that it already has. But do you have any of your own intuitions just about what seems to be happening with ICL? Unfortunately not. Uh, I, I very much appreciate that people are trying, but I've kind of moved out of the game of trying to interpret the internals of these models. Uh, they're beyond me. The dimensionality is so high, and I've seen so many surprising results that I no longer try. 
I know that's not a satisfying answer, but I'm so interested in GPT-4. It's so good, but I can't see its insides. I don't even know how many parameters it has. I've stopped trying to guess what's happening. Given that answer, I guess I, I can't not ask you this question. How do you think about efforts like mechanistic interpretability then? I've had amazing conversations with people in that community. Um, and uh, I, I remain kind of agnostic about whether they'll achieve their goals. Um, I appreciate so much the energy they've brought to it and the community they've built. Um, it feels a little bit to me like tilting at windmills. But um, as I noted in my earlier answer, I'm for a broad and open bottom-up effort on these approaches. Um, and I've appreciated reading a lot of the papers in that space. Um, I think uh, particularly I'll call out some of the recent work they have did to try to understand grokking. I found that to be a very interesting and uh, kind of non-trivial way of looking at that problem. I enjoyed, I enjoyed reading about it. I don't know whether I came out of that paper feeling more or less optimistic. It felt like even at that small of a scale, it was nearly impossible to, to prove things to a degree I felt comfortable with. Um, but, but I really appreciate the effort to try. Um, yeah, I think that's how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You did mention, of course, that you're not really thinking about the interpretive aspects of understanding ICL and things like this. But I guess in your own work on an explorations with prompting, have you... I can talk more about some of the work we did, which I think maybe goes in a different direction. But yeah. Um, yeah. So the two papers you mentioned, I think were, were, were both very neat and very, very different in terms of a, a research perspective. Uh, so the first paper is called Multitask Prompted Training Enables Zero-Shot Task Generalization. This was a paper that was a part of the Bloom Project. So that was a large open source multi-group collaboration, uh, international, uh, almost 500 people involved. Um, it, it was one of the subgroups in that project. And it was one of the more interesting research projects I've worked on. We uh, had a team of folks get together and basically just write prompts for uh, basically every task in NLP. So we sat down and we just wrote them. And doing that was a extremely large effort. We had to kind of decide how to do version control, how to build debugging tools, how to make everything work nicely together. And we had to collect a group of people who uh, were pretty divergent in their interests and goals. Um, I think that model was quite interesting. The model that came out of that was called T0. Um, and it showed basically ways of doing what we would call instruction tuning these days on lots of different tasks. Uh, in practice, I think the, the the main kind of contribution there was really just kind of showing that this kind of instruction tuning works and doing it in an extremely rigorous way. What is it useful for now? Um, I think it's still like widely used as a source of these prompts. And um, I think it was helpful to understand the accuracy on different tasks. One thing that kind of changed, though, in the last couple of years is that people moved on from kind of standard NLP tasks to these much weirder, kind of more conversational, more realistic uh, uh, task benchmarks. And I think that's been a positive thing for the field, although it's made it harder to do evaluation and understand how good models are. The other paper, which is called How Many Data Points is a Prompt Worth, is on the other end of the spectrum. It was basically one researcher with one question. We weren't trying to understand how prompting worked. We were trying to answer a kind of single empirical question which is, if you do training on top of a prompt, how many less supervised points do you need? So um, in, in this context, we were training basically a T5 style model where we gave it a prompt to start with. And we found that we could precisely quantify exactly the number of training points you got by specifying the task in words. Um, this is um, kind of a simple idea. I mean, I think we knew that kind of prompting worked, but it kind of does kind of, I mean, this is the kind of research I like really love to do where 
like we were able to actually come to an answer by running a large set of carefully controlled empirical experiments. We didn't answer anything about the internals of the model, just simply the question of if you are trying to annotate data, is it worth it to write down the task you're doing? Um, and we found that on a small scale, yes. On a large scale, maybe no. Uh, but we could kind of give an exact answer to that question. Okay, there are two things I kind of want to pull out and follow up on in those answers. And maybe I'll start with the first one because I think that's maybe slightly more narrow than the second. You talked about T0 and how this work was really a rigorous form of instruction tuning. And I think at the super high level, you talk about one of your interests in being in building controllable NLP systems and making deep learning models controllable in applications beyond prediction. And so I guess I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what sort of directions, I guess, instruction tuning, RLHF are kind of the elephants in the room right now for this sort of thing. But I'm, I'm curious how you think about controllability, what seems to work, what directions you find useful and promising. Yeah, man, it's it's really changed over the last year. Uh, I mean, this was obviously an area I was extremely interested in in the kind of T5 era. These days, though, it seems like uh, you can get an extraordinary amount of control by simply coming up with good prompts, things like um, reflection-based models or kind of um, self-criticism. That stuff seems to work really well. You just run your model feed its input back in and keep on iterating till you get something like what you want. Uh, to that point, I'm, I, I'm pretty happy with, um, with, with many of the control applications I'm interested in. Um, what am I missing? Um, I still kind of love this idea that you could like have a classifier and generate some outputs that are as high quality as a GPT model but satisfy precisely the classifier's output value. It seems like people have been able to do this with diffusion models, and I love a lot of the work going on with diffusion models for language that try to satisfy control properties like this. It's still not like 100% working, um, but it's an area that I hope people kind of continue exploring. Um, a particular, I'll call out uh, Zhang Lisa Li, who's at Stanford, is doing cool work in this space. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm particularly interested in these days is kind of, uh, attributability. Um, so the ability to kind of train a large language model and kind of know what part of its training data led to a given prediction. I think that's kind of related to control, or at least what we thought about in terms of control in the past, kind of knowing that a certain phrase or a certain, uh, kind of output came from, from some training data and, we are very far from being able to do that, I think, with, with really good models. So I, I guess maybe thinking about the gap there, since we're very far, do you have any thoughts on like what kind of steps could be taken right now to begin closing some of those gaps? Huh. Yeah. I mean, if I had a company and I had to do this stuff right now, I would certainly look at some sort of retrie retrieval augmentation. Um, that seems to be the best way to kind of ensure that certain aspects of your output come from some specific type of data. Um, but I do kind of come down on the side that I think that's probably a hack. Um, I, I don't mean that in a negative way, but I just feel like the kind of ideal model is one that, that really both ingests the data and is also able to um, kind of know and refer to specific aspects in its history. Um, I've, I've heard people argue that that might be impossible for certain reasons, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why people are so negative about that. It, it doesn't feel like, um, I don't know. It feels like you should be able to have a single monolithic model that's able to also recall that it is reciting some fact from some document. Do you think at all about, I guess, the intersection, or I, I guess it's a natural related, but when we think about controllability and NLP models, another very closely related thing people are thinking a lot about is safety. And I think that safety can demand that either the model is controllable externally in every which way, or you have these shog-off memes that, well, the model looks like it's nice to you, but then internally there's something weird going on. And I think people have different ideas around this, like 
the system model and the user model that Martin Wattenberg developed that I think is a really interesting way of visualizing this kind of thing. But I'm curious how you think about that kind of separation or conflict of, of concerns. Yeah, um, I think it's, let's see, what do I think about this? Um, I, I tend to find the conversation about ex existential safety very challenging to connect to research. Um, I'm impressed that folks have been able to do it, but to me, they feel like pretty different parts of my brain. Um, I am interested in control as a problem. I certainly do not think that the way to solve societal fears about AI and language models is by PCA on the vector space of the seventh layer. That being said, I, I think that work is is really good, and I think um, uh, the results seem seem solid. Although um, needs needs more research, needs more scale in, in in that kind of problem, needs to be tried on more problems itself. But um, I, I just don't. I just I, I guess I find it a disconnect when I when I see claims that like a, a kind of small change to a vector in a giant model. Ha could somehow control the, the the safety risk of an entire system. That seems really sensible to me. This might be a good point to talk about some of your other work that's a little bit more open source focused. And um, here I'm thinking specifically about your named tensor project, which I thought was really, really cool. I remember like a while ago when INOPS kind of won me over because it was like, hey, I actually have like names for stuff and can understand what is actually going on here. But I'd love to know, as somebody who both, you know, as you've talked about earlier, thinks about pretty high level issues, but is also spending a lot of time on the details of low level implementation. What is your, when you're using a library like PyTorch, you're implementing deep learning models, what's your kind of style for, for doing this? Like, what are your habits? What do you like, dislike about PyTorch, for example? Yeah. Um, so bear with me. I have a quick story. Um, so I mentioned that I worked on syntax for my dissertation. I was very interested in syntactic parsing and translation. I graduated in 2014, and I got myself a postdoc at FAIR. So this is a Facebook AI research group. And I, I got into FAIR, and I was like, I'm going to work on parsing. And they're like, no, you're not. That's silly. And I said, no, no, that's, that's what I work on. That's what I do. And they were like, nope, <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that. We don't care about that. Um, and I really recommend everyone, once you get to the point you're confident, to have that experience. I think uh, feeling like you're totally lost, totally in the wrong place, and just like out, out to lunch um, really makes you kind of rethink things and, and kind of start over. Um, so the way I started over was I started to learn Torch. Uh, Torch at that time was written in Lua, uh, and it was a real hassle, <laughs> but it was really eye-opening. I, I think even at that point, it was extraordinarily good. Um, and I built um, uh, this, this model that year that was an abstractive summarization model uh, that, that we, we published uh, in 2015. It was one of the first kind of neural summarization approaches. Um, but to build that, I had to kind of learn this structure and, 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 and learn how it worked. Um, after graduating, I started as a professor, and I, I wanted all my students to have that experience. So I had them like learn Lua Torch, and, and I, a lot of my teaching was just teaching them how this worked. By about 2017, uh, PyTorch came out. And frankly, it was just a revelation. It was the first time I, I just felt that I could connect research and coding in such a direct way. Like I could express things that like I had only thought of mathematically almost directly into code and code that ran extraordinarily fast. And I really credit the work that the open source team did for really changing my whole research agenda and just understanding how this new and different way of thinking about the world worked. So I've always been extremely inspired by them uh, and what they've done with PyTorch. I think it's one of the most important projects I've really ever seen. Uh, and so because of that, I, I really try very hard to kind of understand and, and teach how it works. 
Um, I've actually developed my teaching here at Cornell Tech almost entirely around PyTorch. I teach a course where we uh, use a project I built called MiniTorch, where I have each of the students in the class basically build their own little PyTorch uh, through each of the homework assignments. So we cover kind of auto differentiation, uh, tensors, GPU programming, and actually build some real models uh, using using uh, their their version of, of Torch at the end. Um, so anyway, I think maybe other people have different experiences. I've always uh, kind of been interested in that uh, in, in practice. So I think all my open source projects, they're kind of ways for me to explore the boundaries of where PyTorch goes. So um, Name Tensor was about kind of thinking about different ways to add safety to the language. Um, Torch Struct, which was a different project, looked at how you would build classical NLP models like hidden Markov models or context-free grammars in PyTorch. Uh, recently, I've been building a lot of um, puzzles that are just ways for people to learn about uh, different mathematical topics by kind of playing with little PyTorch toys. The most recent one looked at distributed training, where people actually build kind of pipelines or, um, I don't know, different sorts of um, complex distributed training architectures just in a little kind of PyTorch-like language. Since you spent some time thinking about the boundaries of PyTorch, things like, you know, the equivalent of type safety for tensors, that sort of thing, and projects like named tensor, this, I don't know if this is something you've thought about, and I guess maybe recognizing that this is going to look very different for different people, but if maybe it's PyTorch and what it is already, but if you could design your ideal deep learning library for whatever you wanted to do with it. Do you have any thoughts about what that might look like or what it would have that current frameworks just don't at the moment? Huh, it's a good question. Um, the, the problem is, in practice, I kind of assumed that every person doing machine learning would have to kind of code in this language. But more and more, I realized that there are just very different uh, audiences. So the person whose job it is to do deep speed is very different than a kind of undergraduate learning about how MNIST classification works. Um, and so because of that, I think it, kind of heterogeneous tools for how to build these systems might be kind of necessary. Uh, I know that that Torch has done a remarkable job kind of being one tool for, for, for everyone, although I, I certainly think cracks have kind of shown over the years when people try to scale it. I feel like Google's done a better job of building a tool that works at very large scales, but is a little intimidating for entry-level users. That all being said, I'm maybe becoming more and more convinced that the next big question in open source is not how people use and build neural networks, but how people utilize LLMs. Um, I think the last year has been really exciting to see so many different uh, kind of programming interfaces for how people build RAG systems, for how people build prompt systems, for how people connect databases and large language models. And in some sense, I, I almost feel like maybe the abstraction barrier was previously drawn too low, uh, and that at least from an NLP perspective, it, it, it might be possible that that abstraction will be a little bit higher. I think the abstraction needs to be lower than the open AI API. So I think open models, give us a way to kind of rethink what coding with LLMs is. Uh, and I don't think I've seen yet the kind of perfect interface where I feel like super in control to be able to express all the kind of LLM programs I want to build. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I guess already in thinking about PyTorch alone, I do remember I, I spoke to Sumit Chantala a while ago, and I think he kind of had this articulation of I think maybe three main audiences that he was looking at, which were on the one hand modelers, on the second hand compiler people, and then on the third, I think more engineering or software engineering focused people. And I guess in this sort of thing, you were talking about the levels of abstraction. And I know there's so many principles about this, like progressive disclosure of complexity and that sort of thing and building libraries. But I guess just in thinking about the pure, well, what is it that people are doing? It's like the LLM applications that are being built today and the fact that so many people are going into them with more of an engineering mindset does seem to admit the possibility for something like a, a slightly higher level of abstraction and you don't need to worry about a lot of details in there. 
but you still need to preserve that for the researchers who want to do more more in-depth things with it. Yeah, that all makes sense. And I think others have thought about this probably deeper than I have. But I know that deep learning was the first time I felt like the interface motivated my research as opposed to the other way around. Like the tool had to exist first before a lot of the ideas to come into focus. And so um, I think, I, I hope that motivates people thinking about these low level interfaces because they are really important in the process. And I don't think I appreciated that until, until PyTorch. I think a good maybe final question here or, or final theme is one thing that's come up repeatedly in a couple of your answers in this conversation has been when we were talking about ICL and, and a couple of other spots, you seem to me to lean slightly more towards an empiricist mindset as a researcher. And I'm, I'm curious to hear you elaborate just a little bit on how you think about your own commitments as a researcher, how you think about, well, empiricism on the one hand, but then also if you are a person who kind of comes up with theories for things, how you think about what attracts you to a theory about how something works, for example? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think I thought of myself for many years as a systems builder. Um, I was particularly interested in how to craft new architectures and algorithms to solve tasks. Um, that was really what motivated me. I, I think it's still the thing that I get most excited about. The introduction of the transformer and, and then BERT really forced me to go through a lot of these kind of um, growing pains questions pretty early on. I think even by 2021, it became clear to me that the sort of work I used to do was no longer really the, the most pressing thing. I thought a lot about other approaches. Um, I, I have written a, 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 several papers in the past about the internals of models, trying to understand and change the way models work. Um, but I think it, it kind of the change in style came about just from frustration of just how, how challenging it was. And, 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 and I didn't really want to publish results. I, I didn't really feel like I believed. Um, and so I got motivated by a, a lot of nice papers that I was reading that kind of almost came at it from a more scientific angle. Scientific, not in a in a kind of positive sense, but in the sense of just this problem is really hard. We need to collect a lot of data. We need to draw some curves and we need to be honest about the error bars. Um, and so I think um, papers like how many data points is a prompt worth or a recent paper that we're, we're um, presenting at NeurIPS in a couple weeks, which is on um, scaling data constrained language models. They come about from just trying a lot of experiments, trying to draw graphs, try to figure out how these properties work, and, and try to make predictions from this kind of empiricist point of view. Um, and it, I think it comes not from a kind of true belief, but but honestly from uh, uncertainty and feeling like this, this stuff is hard and, and maybe we won't understand it exactly. I think it's a really good perspective. And I, I think this also might be a good place to close out. So I, I really appreciate, I think, all of the insights you've given here. You've dispensed a lot of good advice throughout this conversation as well. So Professor Raj, I, I really appreciate your work and I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me about it and, and just to speak with me today. Of course. Thanks so much. Great talking with you. That's all I have for today. Thanks so much for listening to the episode. And if you like this, really the best thing you can do is to leave me a review and to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting. You can also subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast player. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest from The Gradient to receive emails whenever we have new podcasts, newsletters, articles, then you can subscribe to us on Substack where you'll get email notifications for everything.